G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. Uh, myself, Cad McDonald, is joined by co-host of the show, Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you, mate? Yeah, it's good to be back live in the studio as opposed to doing it cross country or cross state. Oh, were you? In LA, New York? No, what? just humble Watsonia, God's country. Um, we were tempted to do this show live from uh, New York. There was even talks about doing it in Rwanda. Well, we thought we'd stay in. We'll stay in Watsonia, and uh, it was fun actually doing the podcast over the phone. It turned out better than we hoped, but there's nothing like being live in the flesh, in the person, in studio. Look, I, I've you know really talked up our curtains as much as the next bloke, but I did watch uh, the video pod back, obviously, and um, my blank wall didn't comparison. Compare, didn't didn't compare, didn't compare to uh, the setup that you had. Yeah, the fluoro lighting and the brick wall looked unbelievable. Yeah, we did spend a little bit of time in the off season in the COVID break, turning the garage into a bit of a bit of bit of a studio for other podcasting purposes. But uh, none Shout matter. Out Shout out to Drivel, but none matter as much as the back pocket plugger podcast. And with that. Further ado, we'll get into the headline. We'll get into the headline of Dawson Rods Limited. We'll, we'll probably work on the name as well. I think. We've got, yeah, I think we've got a bit more in us than that. And it's a pretty simple one this week. It's probably a pun that's been made a million times over on the headlines. Oh, of course, the cat's out of the bag. They're back, aren't they? And I have to eat my words. I absolutely have to eat my <laughs> words. I wrote them off earlier in the season. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one. Well, three rounds in, I thought they looked slow. I thought that the game was passing. They hadn't adapted to the new game style. But I think what we've seen is that. Not only have the cats sort of quickened up a bit, but the game slowed down a bit. Right? It has, yeah. It was going turbo mode from round one to four, one to five. And now, I, yeah, I'm finding the same where, yeah, teams are slowing down just a touch. It came out the first couple of rounds and we went, oh my God, the game's back to the 80s where it's just 100 points kicked a game, end yep. to end, uh, rapid, rapid ball movement. Um, and it's still better than the, what the product was has been the last few I years. Agree. But it's not that rapid. Uh, it's balancing out a little bit. Balancing out a little bit. So I think that's helped Geelong. And uh, yeah, I think... They're right up there with with any. Their best is good enough to. Is probably. Do you think their best is better than is the best in the league? Yeah, I do. It's I really, about, I really do. Um, I still think there's question marks over. Whether do you think their best is better than the Tigers' best? No, no. Okay, so you lied when I asked. No, the I, first did lie. Question. I did yeah. lie. I um, did lie. Well, I think Geelong beat Richmond by sixty points. Middle of the year. I think that's a. That's that in my head that computes absolutely, but that won't happen in September. No, it won't. If they verse each other in September, that is not happening. So, uh, I think Geelong's best will beat anyone. Everyone gives them this Tigers the cop out of just wait till they get to September, and I understand that. Like they do come good in September, but what I don't really I'm struggling to understand about this is they're coming out against Geelong. I said in last week's podcast when Melbourne played North Melbourne, I don't blame Melbourne for not spending all their petrol tickets in North Melbourne. They know if they spend 75% of their petrol tickets, they'll still get the journey. They'll get from point A to point B. Yep. So why would you spend the extra coin? Reserve your energy. But when Richmond are playing Geelong, it doesn't make sense to me that they wouldn't give 100% effort. Yeah. Like, I don't understand this notion and logic of, oh, don't worry when they get to September. Why not now? Why aren't they playing their best footy against Geelong, a premiership contender? Yeah. How do you just turn it on in September? It's something that I'm not I'm struggling to understand. I, I don't think it's a, a thing in terms of like the players not giving 100% effort, but I think it's like a bigger picture thing where uh, you just know, even if they get into the eight, if Richmond finish eighth, I would hate to verse them in finals. And would. they have started all their premiership years. And I remember Hawthorne did this. I, I remember Hawthorne, when they were winning consecutive flags, would start off... Behind the ledger, three, yeah. three and four, or maybe not three and four, but you're two and threes, two and four, and, and then they chip away from there, and and that's what Richmond have done over the last few years, and it's not about being great right now, um, but on the flip side, you do have to start collecting the wins at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe that's what Carlton's doing at the moment as well. Maybe they're just we're <laughs> deliberately planning our run for September. Don't worry, supporters. We're meant to be three and five or whatever it is. We're going we're to come good when the time's right. The the other thing on Geelong is, um, it's quite funny. Like they should have and could, well, not should have, but could have been zero and four. Yep. Um, they scraped over the line quite fortuitously against the Brisbane Lions. Well said. Could have easily, easily mispronounced that word. I was really worried halfway yep. through. I could tell, but you did well. Thanks, mate. Um, and also against the Hawks, Thriller, uh, Easter Monday footy. They get over As the line. As it often is, the Cats it, be the Hawks. It is. Um, so th- there was a couple of games there where it's like, well, 
they could have been 0-4. And, and then I was watching the first quarter of Geelong and West Coast, and I think they were 1-3, one and, one and, one and 1-4 and or something, but it was sort of that 50-50 game. And that first term, I went, well, West Coast have this. West yeah. Coast have, have – this is their chance to beat Geelong and Geelong, and they've got it. And I was talking to a friend of the show, Druzy, and he goes, cats are done. And I said – I would, you know, I would love it as much as the next bloke if they were. The, the, the glory. But sorry, Drews, I, I, I just won't rule them out. Yeah. I won't rule them out until it's mathematically impossible for them to not make finals. Anyway, two quarters later, they put on 15 goals in a row and they flogged West Coast. And now they've beaten the, the Premiers and they're back. So They're just one of those teams, <laughs> the clubs rather, that has a winning culture. They just... You always have the vibe that they're not out of it, whereas there are other teams that um, even they could be up on the scoreboard and they have the vibe of they're not in it. Like, you're just waiting for them to crumble. Um, but, yeah, it is remarkable the way that Geelong uh, always manage to be there or thereabouts. They've got stars on every line. Like they, they do, yeah. Like they, they don't really have a hole other than um, the perennial whipping boys at Guthrie. <laughs> I love Geelong's <laughs> kids as well. Mm. Um Obviously, people bit of conjecture over why they're not getting a game. Your Constables and your Clarks and it, whatnot. It irks me. I love the new wave of Geelong player, um, yeah. and and it's fresh and it's exciting, <gasps> and they're just sick. I, I'm the biggest Jordan Clark fan. I'm the biggest Charlie Constable fan. I Narkle. I love Sav Narkle. Parfit. Oh yes. I, I love them. I love them all. Um, and it just irks me that a Geordie Clark's not in the regular twenty-two. Would well, uh, you have a Geordie Clark over a Lukey Dale? Uh, probably, yeah, I would. Mm. I would. I think I would as well. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, the cats are back, and I, w- I even as a D's fan, it, it it will be a little bit nerve wracking if we happen to verse them towards that pointy end of the season. Absolutely. Well, for your sake, I hope it doesn't happen because I don't think you'd be able to deal with the mental <laughs> torment and stress that comes long with, <laughs> with that weekend and the potential <laughs> loss. Um, so the cats are on the up, but uh, it irks me. It really does pay me deep to say one of my boys, one of my men, he's seemingly on the way down, down the power rankings. Not saying we can't make the way back up, but our boy, uh, champion Paddy Cripps, it's a if genuine form slump now. Genuine form slump. It's not just a couple of bad weeks and he'll come good. It's getting to a point. There was a point when his form was slumping, and you go, "He'll be back." I don't. It might not be next week. It might be the week after, but he'll be back, and he'll be back to three-time All Australian Paddy Cripps. Yep. Getting to a point now where you're struggling to see that game where he just breaks out, and you go, "Ah, oh, yep, Cripps is back," and it's such. Um, is a conversation that it's not just an opinion anymore. It's pretty much a fact that Bont and Pelly is well and truly overtaken him. And it's not just a form thing. Bont's in better form. It is a, a um, general belief that he – it's a fact that he's a better footballer. Why is there a debate between them? Are they the same age? Uh, I think Cripps might be a year older, but obviously very similar player. Carlton and Dogs were on they the They both up. came on at the same time. Like, they, they – those – two players had a burst onto the scene that we hadn't seen for a little bit. Like sometimes midfielders take a couple of years to, to get the body and get right. But I remember Bont and, and Cripper when they first came on, they were ready made from the word go, which was really exciting. The big bodied midfielder who can supposedly yep. go forward. Yeah, the, the height, the height as well. Yeah. And that was the Vogue. Well, um, that was the Vogue. Cause we gone in the days of the 175 centimeter midfielder. It was like your New fives, age. your Mondays, Cripper, like that height. Yeah. And that big body. Um, and there was a few years, and I reckon it'll still sway. I think, you know, it'll be like the Sam Walsh <laughs> debate, which is now not really a debate at the yeah. moment. But, you know, Sam Walsh will have a, a lame six months because he is human, and, and your Bailey Smith will have a great six months because he's a gun. And, you know, then bored journalists will write a, an article about it. But, yeah, there was a, a little stage where Cripper had him comfortably for about two years. Yeah. Um, but I'm really impressed, and I, you know, I think it is a form slump. But I think Cripper will will achieve all that he wants to achieve in the game. But I'm so impressed by the way the Bond's going about it this year. Absolutely, because he was a bit mundane for a little bit. Yeah, well, he, he just stagnated. He was yeah. never. He, yeah. he, he was never like, oh, gee, this is disastrous. But yeah. it, was just, <laughs> it was no longer. Oh, yep, yeah, he's one of the top five players in the comp. Mm-hmm. Uh, just on Cripper, there's only really. Uh, I've got a couple of theories. 
there is either um, he's forgotten how to play football, which is extremely unlikely, borderline, you know, or otherwise um, <laughs> another word of, way of phrasing would be the game's gone past him, which is unlikely, still prime age. Yeah. But, you know, who knows? Maybe the rule changes. Maybe they figured him out. Clubs have figured out if you put time into him this way, he's going to struggle to dominate. Maybe. Unlikely, but maybe he's been figured out. Yep. Um, then the, the other more likely po- possibility is he's quite simply in a form slump where everyone does him. Um, but, you know, he didn't hate a poor year last year. Mm. And so it's stretched over about 12 months now. So yeah. it'd have to be a long form slump. Uh, the other one is that he's playing injured. Um, he's not 100% right and he's struggling to get through it. But the more interesting option that I'm starting to entertain a bit um, and I'm not here to spark rumours because I've no inside information. This is purely in, in pub chat. Yep. Um, is that maybe he has one foot out? He's out of contract. Maybe he has one foot out the door and is already over in the West. His missus is from West as well. Um, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way to the great man Creeper that he's there going, oh, well, I've already signed a contract with the Eagles, so I'm not going to try for Carlton. He's got a lot more integrity than that. He's got a lot on his plate. But maybe he's just the stress, you know, the deal. There'd be a lot of anxiety with contempl- leaving Carlton. He was our great hope for so long. And, yeah, the weight of the club was on his shoulders and the team would feel that. And now maybe the stress of knowing he has to say goodbye and the the reluctancy, the disappointment, mm. the not embarrassment, but, you know, the, yeah. all the negative emotions that comes with that. Maybe that's playing a part um, in his gameplay at the moment. And, you know, there are big rumours of Adam Chera coming across to Carlton. I don't know. There just seems to be, and Brayshaw as well. So there seems to be a little storm brewing of, and um, Petrovsky Seaton, who's from Perth, is out of contract and he's been dropped. So it seems like there's a bit going on between Perth and Victoria when it comes to Carlton at the moment. So, uh, is your footy? Uh, I might be absolutely wrong here. Is Brad Lloyd your footy? Brad man? Lloyd is yeah, the manager of and, football, and he's from Freo. He was at Freo a couple of years ago, so there's like that link as well. Yeah. So there seems to be a perfect storm bubbling here. Um, Mate, and if this. Uh, Imagine this <laughs> and people just clip this up from about six months earlier. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it's a, it's always a worry when a, a star, especially a captain, hasn't signed a contract yet and, we, you know, the rumours aren't going away. True. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time, not every time, but a lot of the time where there's smoke, there's fire. So we'll wait and see. But um, my, my view on it and my take, like, he is the most Carlton man you could ever meet. Um, yeah. and, and like all the interviews, because I'm a sucker for you know, a bit of a press conference watch on the YouTube. You just love your footy. I don't think you're a sucker. I think you just <laughs> love football. Um, anything I've seen of Cripper, it's very much, I'm, I'm, I'm here to stay. Um, and he seems like he loves the club, obviously. So I, I am of the view, because I've heard your murmurings when you watch 10 episodes of AFL 360 in a row, that it seems like he's carrying something. And I... I it's bizarre that the Blues don't say it. Well, but then again, I'm not surprised I don't say it because true. that's, you know, it almost is a sign of weakness if you come out and say, hey, guys, our captain's injured. And you can't say that as well because then it's like, well, play someone that's not injured. And that's my belief. If he is legitimately carrying an injury that sees him only get 14 possessions a game, which I, it was only one week, he got 14. Yeah. Um, But if he's injured to that extent where he's, so far below 100%. I don't care who you are if you're our captain. I'd rather you sit out. Let's bring a kid in. You know, we've got young kids in the twos doing well, or Josh Honey or someone like that. Bring him in and um, let Cripper recover and bring him back when he's 100%. But it's a tough one because it, you're probably weighing up. Is a 18 possession Paddy Cripps better than a 20 possession Paddy Dow potentially? Like, I'm not sure whether that was the best analogy. I get, but I get what you You sort mean. of got to weigh up whether like a kid's going to have an impact as big as an injured Crips. Yeah. Because he could still win you the match. Well, especially now, you know, I know that if you're at the club, you can't have this belief yet. You certainly can't vocalise it. But uh, it looks like we're not going to be making finals of Blue Baggers. Um, so maybe the time's now to pull the trigger on getting Crips fit. True. And, and um, get a kid in and let's get some more exposure. But enough uh, about the Blue Baggers and time to talk about your mighty demons. Um, what are we, 8-0 now? 9-0? 8 and zip. 8 and zip. <laughs> the good times just keep on rolling along, McDonald. It's a couple of tough contests. Uh, the Kangaroos were really hard against us and sort of brought in this game plan of keep things off. And, it, it, you know, it's not wise to kick deep and long against our defence because we'll either neutralise it or swallow it up. So teams are trying to chip it around, which is quite interesting because it 
means we're not scoring as much and they're in the game for longer. So, um, yeah, the the Roos and the Swans both played really hard, really good footy against us. The Swans pushed us the whole way. T-Bone, Tommy Mack stood up in the big moments. He looked like Wayne Carey at different points, breaking through packs, kicking snaps around the body. He uh, was outstanding. And it... Ben Brown looked good as well. He did, and I I remember he was in he was in my behinds last week because I was iffy on him. I I do love Ben Brown, and I, um, I love the thought of him at his best. But he looked a little bit out of out, out, out of place against the Roos. Just looked, it, it wasn't the big debut that you'd be hoping for. And I think I said if it was round one and we weren't seven and zip, it would make me nervous to see the way he went about it. So I was hoping for a big effort from him. And he played so well. A couple of big marks. Clark, at its highest point, I would almost go as far to say that Ben Brown is plugger territory. Not Tony Lockett. I mean by our definition of plugger. Yeah. As in gets the best out of himself. Like, doesn't have too many tricks to his bag, but he's just perfected the art of the high mark, the lead out, and the straight kicker goal. Just a player who has no right, really, I think, to be a dominant forward in the game. Yep. But it's just got the best out of himself. And I watch him and I go, well, when he when the ball hits the ground, he's not Luke Jackson. He's not picking it up. He's not spinning out of trouble. He doesn't have breakaway speed. But I'm looking at him going, he's not hopeless. Like There's times where he's picking it up, handballing it off. There's times where he's um, tackling. Yeah. So that big rumour, or not big rumour, that big um, idea of Ben Brown being absolutely hopeless when he hits the deck wasn't true. It was in the wet and he competed really, really hard. So I was very impressed. And the other thing with Ben Brown being there, I've never seen Bailey Fritch kick six, kick six last week. Yeah. Not often am I seeing Tommy Mack kick four, kick four this week. And with that, Ben Brown kicked two and three. So it's it's looking all right. Piece of the puzzle. The only, uh, you could argue the, the puzzle's complete, but it is still sad to say our favourite puzzle piece, Sammy <laughs> Wiedemann being left on the outer. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting for the club uh, because this time last year, people are going, well, the defence is looking all right. Yeah. And the midfield's star-studded, but the Ds don't have a forward line. Yeah. You fast, you fast forward 12 months and it's like, the Ds forward line's stacked. I <laughs> it's absolutely stacked. so hopeful that in 12 months' time we're looking back and the Blue Vegas are just dominating and we go, oh, yeah. we just needed to make this little tweak. But, uh, yeah, it is crazy how much of a change 12 months can make in football and the privileged position you're in now. Speaking of Tommy Mack... Has he got uh, something happening in the in the sort of dietary intake department that I'm not aware of? Well, you flagged it with me before the show. I did. Tommy Mack's diet. So I was listening to SEN. Christian Petrarca was on and he mentioned... And I thought is he, he better on SEN than he is 360? He was because it was more... They were doing the... Like Tim and um, Tim and Gary were doing the laughing and taking the piss. Oh, you've got the bag uh, track, you know, with the money. Um and, and Track was laughing a lot along, and then he was given footy answers. Yeah. So when okay. he's on 360, he's a little bit too serious. Like Jack comes in with the rascal and, and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, he, he was good on uh, on SEN. But he did say that Tom McDonald, so I thought this was quite interesting. Mm. Benny Brown, vegan. There you eats go. Eats nothing but vegetables. Tom McDonald eats nothing but meat. The carnivore diet. He's gone the carnivore diet over the summer. I've heard Joe Rogan uh, talk about this. That can't be good for you. <laughs> well, but you the man think so. is playing like a T Rex. You wouldn't think so, but uh, it's it's absolutely unbelievable how the body works and how it adapts. Like mm. uh, I'm no dietitian, but I've listened to many a podcast about this. I do find it very fascinating. And the carnivore diet can have plenty of positives. Can you believe an elite sportsman is eating? Just a meat based diet. I think it just sounds absurd. Like it, the the dietitians wouldn't say, have a, have one broccoli. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have some corn with it, with your patty. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that it's almost like, you know, I don't think if you're eating just meat, I don't think that that is. There's a big difference between eating only meat and if you have meat and a few veg a day. Like, as in, I don't think it's like, oh, hang on, if you eat the f- couple of veg, that's going to ruin your whole carnivore diet. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't I don't see why it has to be all or nothing, why it still can't yeah, yeah. have a bit of veggie in your diet. But I mean, who knows? Maybe, like, with this, uh, what's it called? The k- keto- k- k- ketosis. Ketosis, is that it? Keto diet. Yeah, the keto diet. Yeah. Uh, is that you, no sugar? Nah, there's like... um. Ketosis is when your body's yeah it, using it, an energy source that uh, using a different energy energy source. I can't. I don't want to get because I will get it wrong. Yeah. But say for example, we're, we're so out of our depth at the moment. Yeah. Say for example, your body normally uses carbs for energy. Yeah. Um, and fats are bad. Like you don't want fats when you're in ketosis. Um, 
it you it actually you you only eat fats and then it uses fat as an edu- energy source. Yeah. And when you're using fat as an energy source, you're not storing fat, so you're not gaining weight because your body needs energy to go, and it's just using your fat instead. Yeah. Um, and it's unbelievable how when People with keto that go into ketosis, they only eat bacon and that. When you're usually we're told not to eat bacon, yeah. they only eat fatty foods. Yeah, and big bacon and egg breakfasts and stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah. and they don't. I think I think what they're missing out on is carbs. I could be wrong there, yeah, but I they're not eating pastas. They're not eating breads. They're just eating a whole heap of fat. Yeah, whole heap of avo. And yeah, they, it works well for their body. So it is crazy how the body adapts. I obviously went uh, vegetarian and saw the biggest change in my body ever. Lost ten percent body fat in eight weeks. So it's. As yeah. long as you're committed to whatever diet you choose, I'm sure uh, sure to work it. What diet are you on at the moment, McDonald? Well, tonight I had a palmy and a donut, so yep, sounds about right. <laughs> that can't be. Uh, that's not ketosis. And <laughs> some number one <laughs> AFL YouTuber on the market. Not, uh, <laughs> Certainly not paleo. Uh, I want to have a quick discussion about Richmond's culture. Yeah. Now, when I was driving up the highway down from uh, beautiful Summerton, where I work in a factory, up to the lovely town of Armstrong Creek. Yep. Uh, at Geelong Way, I had the full intention of revving up Richmond's culture because I just read an article that uh, Shay Bolton is turning down big money offers um, to stay at the Tigers. He's a star. He's a star. And he could get a lot more. As much as you want. If he went to another club. As if he could be a top 10 player, money earner in the game. That's how good he is. Yep. Um, and I heard that and I went, Jay, I've heard similar stories about players like Dusty, Jack, I think they're taking play cuts so they can all stay together. They can win more flags. I thought that's magic. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and just as I was about to rev up Richmond's culture, I've done the reverse moles on them because uh, Shay Bolton <laughs> and uh, Daniel Rioli, as it turns out, have been involved in an altercation in a nightclub. Yeah, it was funny. You, you sort of wrote down in your notes, oh, I've got a good one. I've got Tiger's culture. And I went, well, it could go one of two ways. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... They do have a good footy culture. Obviously, their systems and the way that they go about it on field is second to none. Yeah. Um. You know, they versed the Bulldogs when a Riley Collier Dawkins and a Ryan Mansell came in for bloody Koch and whoever went out, and they won. So that their football system, their football culture, their depth, it's unbelievable. But over the last twelve months, they have been a little bit, uh, a little bit naughty off yeah. field. They were one of the most, um, one of the most sanctioned teams over the the COVID period. I remember Koch got in trouble because his wife went to the beauty salon. Um, They had, obviously, uh, Sydney Stack. Yep. Um, They just had article after article about them breaking the rules in COVID. And now another a bit of an incident between the boys down I the do pub. feel sorry for him because obviously we don't know the story. We went there. But you imagine Rioli and uh, who else was it again? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Bolton. Yep getting into a punch on or, you know, a game of 50 cuffs down at the club. I don't think it would have been them strolling in going, right who <laughs> wants oh, to throw no. fists? Come on, mate. The gloves. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to go toe-to-toe with about five this bloody exactly premiership medals between us? <laughs> this is exactly what I want to do after playing football last night. Punch on. <laughs> I reckon it would have been a few drunk idiots, and we all know the type, at a club. Of course. Seeing them going, oh, Rioli, you are the worst bloody three-time premiership medal winner I've ever seen. Yeah. Bolton, you're a bloody pretender, mate. And then they and, that, and that sort of banter can turn nasty when it's one or two a.m. Um, well, I, we don't. Know it should times. turn nasty at any time because that is just. Not and the, on. there are people out there that will just wind them up, which isn't an ex- like just be the bigger person, walk out, um, get in your car, get in the taxi, go home. But obviously, we don't know the situation. But it's it's just it's not a good look, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's not a it's that, not a it's not a good look uh, for the club when you know you're. You've lost a few games on the tr- – not on the trot, but you've lost a few games early in the season. Everyone's pushing this narrative of they'll come right in September. But, you know, when a couple of players are getting involved in altercations uh, and uh, you're starting to think, well, maybe they've gotten a bit ahead of themselves here. They think the job's already done. They're the Richmond Football Club. They can do what they want. Yeah. And uh, they're a bit too big for their shoes. But at the same time, when you're as good as what they are, hey, getting as many punch-ons as you like. <laughs> yeah. Talking about, uh, you know, biffos oh, in the yes. football world, essentially. Yes. Uh, how Are you as sick of the prison bar debate as I am? I was as sick of it as soon as it started, let alone now. This is just becoming the biggest farce and wank and just cringy. <laughs> it's getting cringy. It's getting cringy because it's no <laughs> longer about... I feel like the, the supporters don't even care It's not anymore. about the Guernsey. It's not about the heritage. It's not about the supporters anymore. It's about the big... 
fat cat egos that are flying around in the AFL. I know uh, one Port supporter, and I obviously know a lot of Pies supporters. Yep. None of them, none of the Pies fans are coming out going, if they wear the prison bar guernsey, I'm bloody writing a letter or we're protesting out the front of the AFL. The poor fan I know doesn't really can't really be bothered too much about the prison bar guernsey. Like obviously they'd like it, but they're not stressed. Yep. Why it's it's like they're saying that this is war between the clubs, but it's just David Kosh and Eddie Maguire, who's not even <laughs> affiliated with the club anymore. Yeah, just getting real personal and <laughs> like Eddie's on Eddie's on Fox Footy, so it's hard. He's on there commentating about it, but he's is is commentating on himself, like yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then he's decided to take it personal by bringing Koshy's bloody schnoz into the equation. He's Hoover. Well, Koshy was saying that Eddie McGuire's the Donald Trump of the NFL. They're just going, this is, it's turning very childish, isn't it? What did you think about Port Adelaide putting the Guernsey on to sing the song after the game? I thought it was one of the most cringeworthy things I've ever seen. So you weren't a fan? I wasn't a fan just because... It was a a bit smart alecky. Oh, well, uh, it wasn't even, I understand the smart aleck bit of, look, (coughs) AFL, you said that we can't wear it during the game or you'll find us four points. Fair enough. We're just going to wear it after the game and make a statement. But um, I just think that if this was about something bigger than the Guernsey, I, I don't know. Like racism or... Yeah, or racism or... Yeah, any or if, say, say it was about um, they've gone, look, the, the grand finals at the MTG every single year, and say they had a stat where 80% of the time the interstate teams lose because... Not, a, the, not on their back deck And they were protesting it I'd go This is for something big You know This, yeah. is, this is for them To get a grand final At home They're sick of playing and the, You know Something like that I'd understand Yep But For the stripes on your Guernsey Who cares what Guernsey you wear Does it really Does it really matter Yep Do you think it matters So I was saying that I I think I've got The alternate view In terms of Everyone goes They should be able to wear it Who cares I was listening to Eddie and he was saying... Eddie it, VK? Yeah. Yep. And Eddie was saying it's like a trademark thing. Yep. Um, and when you came into the AFL, uh, they you can't have black and white. And everyone's saying, oh, you, you don't own black and white. But when we think of oh, the, the blue and white team, you go, oh, Geelong. When you go, oh, the red and blue team, you go, oh, the Ds. Oh, the yellow and black, you go, the Tigers. So I don't think there's two teams in the comp that share colours. And I know you can't trademark uh, black and white, but if someone overseas was like, oh, who's that black and white team? Oh, Port Adelaide. Oh, no, it's I don't know. You can start it to uh, dilate the trademarks of yeah, both well, sides. Yeah, well, for mine, I, when I say who cares, I'm not in the camp of who cares, let them wear it. I mean, the who cares whether you're in your prison bar games? They just wear the bloody teal, mate. You're the, yeah, you're the teal sort. That's Port Adelaide. Yeah, the Port Adelaide power. You're not the Port Adelaide magpies. Yeah, you're the Port Adelaide power. The Port Adelaide power of teal. Be proud of the teal, mate. Wear the teal with gusto. And as Eddie was saying, like, look in the stands. Like the the supporters are wearing black and white. Yeah. Um, on their scarves, on their membership scarf, they've got the magpie as a bit of a nod. So they, it is starting to get trademarky. Where I go, I do see the side of Collingwood, but I love the heritage and I, yep. I love the top and I love when they play in it. But I do see that uh, a murky water, which they're starting to step in. I love that fake mock up top where it's the prison bar guernsey but the white is teal and it looks sick lovely why isn't that it's the, the top? design but it's the teal and black it looks sick it looks unbelievable i reckon it almost looks potential well not better because the prison bar is a great top but it looks unbelievable so why if they don't could, they just run with that if they could meet celebrate in the, mi- the old if they could meet in the middle um apparently there's rumors it's going to go to court like that, it, this will not Imagine be. Imagine rocking up to court over a footy jumper. <laughs> That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> You're walking it? in, and all the cameras on you. Sorry, uh, dub, sorry, double homicide. You just have to wait. <laughs> you just have to wait a second. We've got a prison bar, Guernsey. You, you'll be, you'll go, you'll go to prison in due course. Yeah. We've got a prison. You'll bar. get your day in court. Yeah. It's just not now. We've it's got the a footy jumper. <laughs> yeah. Um, in saying that, we both said that we're absolutely sick of the prison bar debate, and we've just spent a good 10 minutes of our podcast uh, talking about it. So we will move on to everyone's favourite uh, segment. Tool of the week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, it's time for the GBOs, <laughs> the goals behind and the outs on the full. I'll kick us off this week. Yeah, well, it's going global. It's going trending. It it's, is. Um, it's, it, it's littered throughout AFL. Vernacular? That's, uh, uh, no, uh, AFL uh, or folklore? Uh, 
vernacular. Oh, oh, I wanted to say paraphernalia, but uh, that's not the word. But uh, AFL, uh, the zeitgeist. The what? <laughs> no, that wasn't what I expected I to be coming. Zeitgeist means like pop culture or like right. the world. Like yes, okay. In the zeitgeist. Okay. Um, the atmos. So, yeah, in the zeitgeist of the AFL, there's plenty that's of scope a, for, the, for this. To be that's there. a new one for me, but luckily the structure <laughs> of the GBOs isn't new to anyone. We'll start with the out on the full. And for mine, it is the continuing confusion around the deliberate out of bounds. No, you just saw mine. Did I? <laughs> You're gone, <laughs> sir. Great, great minds think alike. Um, for me, it's getting to a territory where I'm – Unfortunately, something that's unavoidable in our great game is the grey area. In every in every single decision, there is grey area. It's so rare that it's black and white. I want to jump in quickly. So um, my dad will watch games and he, after every game, goes, I got so frustrated at the umpires. Yeah. And I go, and, and a lot of people do. A lot of people go, umpires were shit, umpires were shit, umpires were shit. I walk away from games going... I reckon umpires got 90% of their, well, 95. I reckon every AFL game, they get 95% of their calls spot on. In the, But their calls are in the realms of that grey area. Yep. Like, that is a push in the back, but it was very light, so it might not have been paid. But th- So someone will go, that's a wrong call. That's not pushing the back. Yep. No, but it is. It's in the grey area. It's in the grey area. R- it would have been right if you paid it. It would have been right if you didn't. Exactly. So people are walking away from games going, umpires were shit. When I think most games, umpires are spot on. That is literally the science behind why one-eyed supporters are such a thing in football because everyone leaves a game. And, of course, when you are as invested and, um, you know, as loving of your team as what you are, you leave and you think all those grey area decisions have gone against you. They haven't gone against you. They've just fallen in the grey area. And, you know, and it does happen occasionally where – the grey area happens just by just by chance, by happenstance. The grey area happens to fall in one team's favour. That does occasionally happen, and you leave thinking you were particularly robbed. But for the most part, it's just grey area. But what I was um, alluding to, sorry, mate, no, yeah. uh, is that if we want to eliminate the grey area and the deliberate out of bounds, because it is so hard to establish in your head, you know, was that player doing everything they can to keep it in? Yep. Would you consider a, a last kick, not a last touch, last? If it comes off hands, you're tackled out of bounds, throw in. But would you consider a last kick? If you kick it and you fail to keep it within the realms of play, it's a free kick to the opposition? It's essentially what it is at the moment. Like, um, uh, what's the wording? Uh, uh, not doing everything. I don't know the exact wording, but it's something along the lines of um, not um, making every effort. I- insufficient attend. intent. Yeah. In- in- insufficient intent to keep it in. Which, so if you watch, because I still have mates, we'll sit around Friday night and they go, that's not deliberate. And I go, it's not deliberate, but he's kicked it so close to the boundary line and it's gone out that he hasn't tried to keep that in. Yeah. That's an insufficient attempt to keep it in. So when I'm watching through the eyes of that rule, it doesn't irk me as much as that's not deliberate. Yeah. I think if you get rid of that and just get it away from deliberate, get it away from insufficient attempt and just change it to that rule, which is still the insufficient attempt rule, yep. just a bit more clearer. That makes more sense. It gets rid of the grey area and people will be there saying, stop changing the rules. But it's not the rules that that everyone hates. It's not the changing the rules that people hate. It's the interpretation of the rules that yep. people hate because people go from year to year, the interpretation changes, the grey area increases or or becomes different um, depending on what the rule is. But if we eliminate the grey area and you go, if you kick it and you fail to keep it inside play, it's a free kick to the opposition. Eliminates all the grey area. We won't have any murky waters. That will just be a simple free kick. I think that's the way forward. I think that will happen at some point. And that could be exciting because if you have the ball and you know that it's the last kick, no one touches it, it's a free kick to the opposition, you're more likely to go down the guts. You or just closer, have to, yeah. Closer to the guts. You're not going to kick it down the line. So um, I think that it, that's actually the rule already in the sample. Yeah. Um, and it's worked well for them. So, And they trialled it in NAB Cups. I remember in NAB Cups a couple of years ago they had it. Well, let's see if that's the way forward. What's your out in the full, mate? Yeah, the last touch. Oh, yeah. Yours no, was um, well. Yeah, no, I had the same thing and I, I agree with, with what you said. I'll kick off the behinds. Um, this is obviously behinds is where, you know, it's it's not, not a goal, not a behind. We all know what it is by now. It's sort that, of a it's watch this space. Watch this times. space, be yep. iffy about it. Lockie Hunter. Mm. Um, irks, irks me when I watch him. Irks me. And he's a star and I love him and I, I, like, I do respect him, but 
I get so frustrated watching him in particular because he he focuses so hard on getting a free that he'll stop playing the game. Yep. And that irks me to yep. watch. And I get borderline triggered when I watch where I go, what are you – What are you, Lockie Hunter, you have the pace, the smarts, the skill to zigzag in through a contest, get out, bit of play, give a handball to Johannesson running past, Bulldogs are out. But he'll go in and – the arm, the, the lowering of the knees and the arm lift irks me. I'm not a big fan. And, you know, Charlie Spargo does it for the Ds. Yeah. Jetta does it for the Ds. And I don't love it. Um, so that, that... Riley Lowton down at Banyol is the king of it, if anyone's uh, familiar with the cave. Bakes, Bakes does a good one. Really? Yeah. Lowers the knees, lifts the arm. It's it's not the sail would just stiffen the arm. It's yep. the, the ducking of the knees, lowering your body, centre of gravity, lift the arms. And there's a picture that was in the Geelong Advertiser and it's bakes like this and he's just got this bloke ripping his head. Really? Yeah, I've got well, we, um, it's become such a <laughs> trademark of uh, Riley Layton set on the bench, uh, on the not on the bench, on the sidelines because he plays one, so I'm not on the bench there. <laughs> uh, we counted and it was over 10 high free kicks in the one game. Yep. So very good at it. Yeah. Well, Lockie Hunt is one of the best. So... That that does irk me, but the second one that he does uh, that irks me more is if he has it and you tackle him, he will just dive forward. So I I hate that one. You and it's one of those ones where both players are on their knees and you're just wrapping him. So you you haven't charged in and carried your momentum into his back. We are we are dead still, and you're just holding him, and he'll just. Fall that should forward. be an out in the fall every week. Oh. I hate that. Oh, you are hundred percent right. It irks me. It that they need to be spun. I don't blame the umpires because the rule doesn't state this yet. But yeah. the rules need to change, and the umpires need to be smart enough. Where if the player with possession of the ball is the one who initiates the forward thrust, then it can't be. Yeah. In the so back. the forward thrust is not coming from behind. It no. is coming from the front, and you're dragging your player into your back. I hate that the look of it. I hate the view, and especially when Lockie Hunter is a star. Yeah, he's a gun around the contest. He is so, so good, and I just hate that he's spending his time. It's not cheating, but he's he's spending his energy trying to manipulate a rule rather than just playing the game, which he's so good at. I want to make that a real uh, narrative for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. We had. Um, I, I really want to keep the captain's call going. I think that there is. Oh, I can't believe that. So you you brought up the captain's call. In a couple of episodes, and I was like, well, that's such an outlandish call. That's such an outlandish uh, statement. It's Arnie, gaining legs. It's gaining traction. Lee Montagna's brought out the captain's call. Yeah. Everyone's talking about it. I, well, I think that we don't want to keep on treading onto old territory, but I just think that that, once again, eliminates the grey area. There's no more conversation of, oh, we were robbed by the umpires. Because you had your chance. You had your chance. If the captain ruined it, you can only blame yourself. No, good call. Um, anyway, moving on to... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I want to keep that a narrative of... We need to banish the dive forward free kick for in the back because that is a blight on our game. That does my head in as well. It's not a good look. I don't think Lockie Hunter's going home watching the highlights and going, oh, yeah, yeah. that's unreal. I think he's probably watching going, I felt like I needed to do it at the time, but it's it just doesn't look I don't good. necessarily blame him. He's one needs team a free kick and a goal. So, hey, if you of can come with a free kick, good on you. Like you, you're, you're exploiting the rules, but I think we need to make the rules inexploitable. Yep. Uh, my behind is... The weird psychology of football, um, and what I mean by that, there's a million ways you can interpret that, but um, <laughs> the mighty Banyol Bears uh, on the weekend, the reserves, uh, we were playing a team, top of the ladder, Eltham. They'd won every game by 100 points. The t- we were undefeated as well. The teams we were beating by six goals, they were beating by 100 points. Yep. Uh, and at three-quarter time, we were playing at their ground. Eltham were up by a goal. And up until three-quarter time, the mentality was sort of like, let's win the game, let's win the game, let's win the game. Quarter, Three-quarter time hits. We know that they're the team to beat, really, for the season. We're up by a goal. And all of a sudden, without even speaking about our whole chatter at three-quarter time was let's keep pressing, but something flicks in the head where you go from let's not win the game, uh, let's win the game to let's not lose the game. And it's that change in mindset, that shift in psychology, that mm. everyone, it filters throughout the whole team. And where that, and translating it to the AFL, Carlton, we're up by 25 points halfway through the third quarter, looking fantastic. And weirdly, like, you, it's a, such a hard thing to describe because you're not, it's not like you stop trying to get the ball. It's not like you go against everything your team stands for. Yeah. There's just this weird shift in sub in your subconscious, in your psyche, mm. that makes you go into your shell. And it's 
something that's impossible to explain. And I, I was, it's behind because it adds so much fear to, to the game. You have teams that are mentally weak and they're in front and you know that they're going to, they're a chance of crumbling. It adds a lot of theater, but I just like to know how that works in, in the brain. Have you felt that before? I have. Absolutely. I have where I go from like, you're not even thinking about the game. You just, Playing footy, you just yeah, get the yeah. ball, and then all of a sudden, when it gets to the last quarter, you start thinking about the game. You're not, you're yeah. no longer just playing off instinct. You're like, you're constantly thinking. If that makes sense, yeah, it's such a weird thing. I've got a couple of non-footy examples. Um, there's times, Ethan Baker. Well, he's one of the most natural sportsmen. One of my best mates. Um, he will come from the clouds in any sport, and he's just so naturally talented. It's ridiculous. But there was. There was times we went bowling and I was winning by like 20, 30 pins all day and he needs needs a couple of strikes at the end and I've sort of, I haven't nailed my last one. So instead of me getting like three or four balls back because, you, you know, you strike on the last one, I've sort of missed a couple of pins, ended the game, went a big lead, strike, strike, strike. And another example of that like mental crumbling from my point of view um, is like beer pong. We'll be playing beer pong. Right, yep. I'll have one cup to hit. Miss, miss. He'll have the whole thing, but he will just come back in a storm and I just can't hit this cup. I've hit every other cup, but I can't hit this cup. And that feeling of like momentum and that feeling of the mental fragility and why can't I just, oh no, here he comes, here he comes. It, it's crazy. And when you watch teams, a whole, a whole team, how do you get 18 blokes to snap out of that? It's, it's crazy momentum. And it's crazy that it's not like it's three blokes. It's the whole team. It yeah. built. It's it just works its way through the whole team. Where like it happened. Like I can't explain how well we were playing for three quarters on the weekend. At my team personally, and then on the last quarter, everyone just went into this weird, weird shell. So something that I like, like momentum, is something that's impossible to explain. Yeah, you have twenty two blokes, the exact same ability they were at the start of the game and the end of the game, but just for some reason at different points, they're, they're all trying a hundred percent. Why is it at different points one team becomes unstoppable and one team becomes absolutely woeful? In the same game where we've kicked six in a row, we're now conceding four in a row and it feels like we can't buy a goal. And <laughs> like, like we don't why, even why look like that? it. Why? And the game plan hasn't changed. It's just momentum. What <laughs> is that? What is that strange force? Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. We'll get to the bottom of that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get the labs onto it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go with the goals. Uh, one of my favourites. <coughs> I've got a couple of favourites uh, in the AFL that I, I keep tabs on, but this man in particular is one of my favourites. Debuted on the weekend, Buku Kamas. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely loved him. Um, that video of him and Bevo, Bevo nearly cho- choking back tears. Yep. That got me. Oh, as you know, I'm a crier. Yep. I don't mind a cry when I get particularly emotional. Mm. And I nearly shed a tear. That's how much I it enjoyed that video. Um, how is he? He said when he got drafted, you probably... Oh, well, to get drafted, probably a million to one to play footy. Yep. But then after the COVID break last year, when you came back, you're probably two million to one. So mm. he must have got unfit or... Because yeah. it was a tough period. We were all in lockdown, very hard for everyone. Uh, a young kid who isn't a professional athlete, so he can't... Yeah, I'm filling in the gaps here, putting the puzzles together. But it, it seems like he, he, he didn't come back fit through that COVID break. But to work his way back, I thought his debut was really, really good. Really, really solid down back. He's exciting when he has ball in hand. He's solid in defense. Um, and it's just funny because uh, myself and Cookson, he became a bit of a cult figure in our AFL Evolution career mode because we interviewed the Bont on the Brownlow red carpet. And we were saying, who's who's most likely to fall asleep, you know, yeah, uh, at, at the club. And he just, in the most Australian accent ever, he just went, oh, a, a young fella, Buku Kamas. He's <laughs> probably someone who falls asleep. And we went... Who is Buku Kamas? Oh, Buku Kamas. Like, I, 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 we had no idea what he said. So I would have thought he's taking the piss out of you. Yeah, it was just... Oh, we didn't quite twig what he said. And then... We just started saying Buku Kamas all the time. Oh, Buku. Oh, we, you know, Buku. Oh, yeah. Just as, it, as an yeah, exciting yeah. word. Um, so we got him. I've got had him. a double shot of espresso. I'm feeling bloody Buku Kamas. Yeah, feeling a bit Buku <laughs> Kamas. Um, anyway, we got him on AFL Evolution. Became a bit of a cult figure in our, you know, in our own little zeitgeist. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> and then, yeah, I was just yeah really stoked for him to debut. Played well, got the win. So stoked for Buku Kamas. What's the word again? Sight guys, is that a bit like canon? You know the word. It's in it's in the canon. Like, the uh, oh yes, uh, 
they're in the same realm, but Zeitgeist is like like pop culture. Like um, Justin Bieber is in the world Zeitgeist at the moment. He's in. He's around. Right. Okay. I'm still not. I believe I'm using crashing. that right. We're losing a my <laughs> my goal, and I think it'll be your goal. You know, you'll resonate greatly with you. Is uh, seeing Neil Danaher at the footy. Mm. It seems like for years now. I remember watching five years ago when Mark Robinson was choking back tears, and I imagine Jared was as well on 360 with Neil basically saying, "Yeah, look, it's more than likely this is going to be my last year on the on the Queen's Birthday Show of AFL 360 on the." On the uh, on the big freeze and everyone, you know, it was a bit sad. It's like this might be the last time we see him, but he keeps on pushing along. He's at the footy. He's watching the D's go eight and zip. I'm so happy for him. And great friend of the show, Michael Allen, co-host of Drivel, uh, said to me, put this to me, and he goes, imagine the D's win the flag and Neil Danaher presents the cup. Oh. And it'd be the great, <laughs> the greatest moment in footy history. Yeah. Uh, that oh would re- that Now yeah, that would reduce me to tears. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. Crazy. I'm getting told me I'll be shattered if it, if the days do make the grand final and they pick anyone else to present the cup, but um, but Neil Danaher, if it's a Russell Robinson or an Adam Moose, <laughs> like, I will be seething. It has to be Neil. Danaher. Put the guitar away, Robbo. Don't yeah. don't go to the podium with the guitar, mate. Um, yeah, no, he they flashed a picture of him on screen at the ground, and everyone just started clapping. Oh. Like everyone around us, like stood up and just started clapping him. Um, and then a- another touching little moment at the end of the game, uh, Ron Barassi was singing the song. Oh, absolutely. Um, get, getting on with age, Ron. He, he's looking looking a little bit older these days, but he's still going to the footy, still getting around the Ds. So, uh, yeah, uh, the freeze for MND, that, that'll be coming up this year. Um, yep. So excited for that. It, it is it, – it's – that story is just unbelievable. Like they'll make they'll make <laughs> um maybe not a movie, but a full blown documentary about that one day. If I got told I had a illness that was going to take my life, I would be in my room doing sweet nothing for the for, for the rest of my days. I don't think well, I don't know if I'd be doing that, but I think I would believe a pretty selfish life is in it. It'd exactly. be, yeah. right, I want to go to WrestleMania. I want to do this. Like, yeah. I want to tick off all these boxes. I want to go with Crystal so, Palace get to get so in selfish. London. You would get so selfish. I, I don't know if I could say, as, as much as I like to pride myself on being a bit of a selfless sort of like, I couldn't imagine me I'd be going, dedicating my last year or supposed year to, to helping others. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and to see, not just how, like this... This illness and this uh, pocket of society that is very prevalent, like th- there's a lot of people that have this, this illness, this beast, they've had no hope for years. Yeah. But like they've had nothing. Nothing. They've had like no financial support. Yeah. They've had, there's, there's been nothing. And now there is, and there's a big He's wave. He's given them the glimmer. Yeah. Like they, they know that, look, there's every chance that they might bow out before they're, this cure. But at the very least, he's given them a genuine glimmer. And if not just a glimmer, it's put them on the map and it's made everyone aware and thoughtful of them. And that means a lot too. And it'll go on for years and years. The big freeze is one of the biggest footy events. So Absolutely. Yeah, unbelievable. What a man. Um, what, what, a great, what a great note to sort of wrap up the uh, another edition of Back Pocket Blogger on. Absolutely. Um, Rog, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again sometime. I yeah, think. we went. Um, I, I can't remember if we discussed it yet, but this week, if anyone was wondering, we didn't go the Indian, we didn't go the Hungry Jacks, we went the pub feed. Pub feed, yeah. Um, and I reckon we'll return back to India next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll return to India next week. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Get that India. <laughs> uh, actually, we won't be going to India apparently, unless we want to get in a dust uh, dust up with Sluts and Davy Warner. I reckon we'll stay. You can get locked out of the country. Yeah, we'll just stay. We'll, we were actually the two blokes hitting up Shea Bolton and Daniel Rioli during the week. <laughs> Maybe we don't need to target Sluts and Warner as well. Um, yeah, beautiful. Uh, thanks. Just to- just quickly, one last thing before before we finish yeah. the Stewie McGill thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just want to say, did you hear about his injuries? No. Oh, mate, oh, well, it's not confirmed yet, but there's just rumours of a couple of vicious leg breaks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> oh, I made it up. Did you? I made it up at the club on the weekend. He got a ripper reception. I should put that on the TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you that story, by the way. Just, just FYI. Uh, that's it for us at the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. Um, we appreciate everyone who watched we appreciate everyone who listened and we'll see you all very very soon keep plugging those back pockets